Madam Vice Chancellor, Madam Chairman of the Alumni Association, members of the University Hierarchy, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an honor and a privilege to be asked to deliver the alumni lecture at any time, but particularly so on this auspicious occasion of the 75th anniversary of the university. I take this opportunity to offer my heartiest congratulations to, to the university and all persons associated, past and present, Vice Chancellors, past and present, members of the university, past and present, you have built a great university. I know that more capable minds and hands will chronicle the history of this great center of learning and research. So for now, please accept my Anyako. As has been said, I follow a long line of eminent speakers, 33 to be precise, dating from 1974, who have delivered this lecture. The names are too many to mention individually. In fact, they ha some have been mentioned. Suffice it to say that they have ranged from academics and diplomats to economists, doctors, lawyers, judges, to politicians and public servants. I salute all previous speakers. And in particular, Ambassador D.K. Osei, who delivered last year's lecture. In that long list of speakers, I was surprised to find only one private sector person, and that was Mr. David Andor, the first Ghanaian CEO and chairman of the then UAC. Let me also mention Major Retired Ablokwaku, who delivered his lecture on entrepreneurship. I therefore find it truly exciting as another private sector person to be asked to join this elite group of speakers. I thank the executives of the University of Ghana Alumni Association and particularly you, Madam Chair, for the quiet determination and the consistent efforts that have made this lecture possible. And We've been talking for, what, two years now? I'm sorry it took so long. Your confidence in selecting me to share my thoughts within these hallowed walls on a subject of my own choosing is remarkable, for I'm no academic. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, in the hall this evening for turning out in such numbers to listen to me. Let me start with a short recollection of my own fond memories of Lagon. Some of it you may have heard, but my association with this great university began on a bright September morning 51 years ago when I arrived here as a 17-year-old undergrad with not a care in the world and no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I left three years later with a degree in economics minor in geography. I chose economics because it sounded more useful than sociology to my uh, unlettered, unlettered mind at that time. But it was sociology which caught my attention in the Mensa Saba Hall Library. And I know for a fact that I read more books on sociology than economics because I found it more interesting. This is what a great university does to you. It opens up new horizons. In 1986, I came back to study in the law faculty for the qualifying certificate in law and went on to the law school in Makola and was called to the bar in 1989. The one memorable thing about my second stint in Legon was that I met my future wife, who was also a law student. That meeting alone was worth coming back for. 
and I considered the call to the bar in 1989 as an added bonus. From, nine, from 2006 to 2009, I was back as chairman of council, and that was an exciting experience particularly when we succeeded in appointing His Excellency Kofi Annan as Chancellor. It was a great victory because all other universities wanted him, not just in Ghana, but around the world. And it was quite a fight getting him. And we considered it a great victory. The addition of 7,000 beds to student accommodation through a local bank-funded initiative and the visitation program were both firsts in the history of public tertiary education in Ghana. In all these successes, permit me to acknowledge the part played by a lady who was a member of my council at that time and is presently the chancellor of this university. And Here's to Mrs. Mary Chinry Hesse. Let me also acknowledge Dr. Frank Edu, who, as the then managing director of Carl Bank, arranged and led the consortium of banks that lent the then colossal sum of $20 million for the accommodation project. It was truly a huge sum. And he got, I think, two or three other friends who were managing directors of other banks and who had been in the School of Administration with him, and they all put the money together for that project. Frank, wherever you are, thank you. I don't think you have been acknowledged enough. I recount my own background and the genesis of my association with Legon to demonstrate to the young Legonites here and to the many young people across our nation that this university is an equal opportunity creating institution. The University of Ghana offers you a world-class education that prepares you to take your place anywhere your ambition and effort will drive you. Please make the most of your time here. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, the invitation to me said this is an annual event which brings together alumni, academia, and the general public for a thought-provoking evening. My intention this evening is to share some stories in a conversation which I hope will make you live here seeking answers. As an academic community and also as a general audience, I will be satisfied if our conversation compels you to seek more information about the economic history of our nation and the policy choices we have made. And the first story started in 1897 when a company was incorporated in London and listed soon after on the London Stock Exchange. The promoter of this company was an English man called Edwin Arthur Wade. He was a trader who sold British manufactured goods, mainly alcohol, trinkets, cloth, and the such, to customers in the Gold Coast colony. His newly incorporated company was based solely on the resources of a mine located in what was to become modern-day Ghana, but was then a part of the Asante nation in a nondescript village whose name translated literally as under the stone, or Boase. Wade had not discovered the mine, nor prospected for gold in any way, the resource in the mine. He had purchased the mining concession from three fancy gentlemen, Joseph Biney, Joseph Ellis, and Joseph Brown. Forget their names. They were as uh, Gold Coasters and Ghanaians like we all are. Indeed, before Wade's purchase of the concession, the richness in the belly of Obuase had been deliberately kept secret from the many Europeans who sought to know 
the source of the gold for which the Gold Coast had become famous. The three Josephs had negotiated a hundred year mining lease from the Bekwaehene, who was administering the area for the Asantehene, because the true owners, the Adansi people, in their never ending confrontations with Asante, had once again been chased away. From their small-scale mining operation, these three indigenous partners sent samples of gold to their European trading partner, this weighed man, in exchange for the usual European goods. After getting the samples assayed, Edwin Atawait, in great excitement, jumped on the next ship out of Liverpool. Two weeks later, he arrived in Cape Coast, then traveled for 12 days by hammock, born aloft by the indigenes, what they used to call the natives, to reach Oboase. On reaching Oboase and seeing the mining activities by the locals, Edwin Wade promptly signed a lease sale agreement and paid 200 pounds deposit right away to acquire the concession. He later paid an additional 2,500 pounds to the three Josephs and granted them some token shares in the new company called Ashanti Goldfields Corporation. Originally, the three Josephs had asked for 250,000 pounds, but they settled on 2,700 pounds. And for clarity, that money today would be worth 513,000 pounds only. Therefore, the mining concession for what came to be described as the richest square mile in the world was sold and purchased for the equivalent of 513,000 pounds in today's money. As for the Bekwaehene and the Asantehene, the traditional owners of Oboase, their total entitlement was an annual ground rent of 133 pounds and 66 pounds, worth 20,000 pounds in today's money and 10,000 pounds in today's money. And these two rent payments remained in place for the next 70 years. They were only changed in 1967. To put it bluntly, our forebears led foreigners to our wealth and handed it over to them for almost nothing. Today, ladies and gentlemen, our nation is in anguish about foreigners taking over gold mining illegally. Ghanaians still bring in foreigners and take them to places where they, the Ghanaians, know gold can be found for a pittance. Sometimes, not more than a few pickup vehicles, a few bottles of schnapps, and insignificant amounts of cash. We allow the mining of our precious metals to be led by foreigners who take away the major share of the wealth generated. We can excuse and forgive the three Josephs for their naivety and simple-mindedness. But how about our generation with our education, our awareness, and our supposed sophistication? Should we forgive ourselves? Whose fault is it? Is it our destiny, even in this 21st century, to hand over our wealth for little or nothing? In fact, in the even more formal and large-scale mining, our laws mandate 10% free shareholding by the state in every mine. But some mines declare little or no profit. So dividends from the shareholding are a pittance compared with the value of minerals being mined. It is known and the published view of the Ghana Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative that, I quote, the 10% carried interest has yielded insignificant returns over the years, unquote. Let me give you a real example. In a 10-year period, one mine, not a gold mine, but one large-scale mine, 
declared losses in seven years. In those 10 years, no dividend was ever declared. Due to huge loans, it has supposedly taken from its parent company. I say supposedly because, and I was involved in this, there were no assets in the company to show for the loans. Also, the loans were taken not from a bank or any financial institution. The loans were taken from its parent company, which means it was not at arm's length. During the same period that this company was posting consistent losses, the company doubled production. In effect, the foreign owners of the mine were taking away the minerals for next to nothing. They were only paying a 3% royalty, which they are required to pay under the law. They were depleting the mineral resources for almost no benefit to our nation. It is sad, but true, that this mine had Ghanaian board representation on behalf of the state. The board members must have seen the financial manipulations that robbed this nation of its mineral wealth. They did nothing and said nothing. Whether it is through the incompetence of the board representatives or their complicity, such situations should not be allowed to continue. It is time for the state to insist on minimum competencies for all directors representing the state on boards and to hold them truly accountable. Financial and corporate governance skills should be minimum skills for sitting on any public sector board or any corporate board on behalf of the nation. My next story is similar. And I recount it only to show us the future of the mining industry especially gold mining. As I see it, if we do not take the urgent action required now to stop illegal mining, I'm no prophet, but ladies and gentlemen, our actions leave me in no doubt as to the future. A hundred years ago, the land covered by present-day Ghana was made up of about 70% forests. Today, that figure has declined to less than 10%. Scholars estimate that by 2026, that is three years from now, forests outside forest reserves will have been completely disseminated. Even within forest reserves, it is estimated that half of such areas are seriously degraded or without any forest at all. The major cause of this destruction is the timber industry, another exploitative industry like mining. To quote one researcher, even though one of the reasons given to justify the struggle for independence in the Dengo Coast was mismanagement of our forest resources by foreigners, forest exploitation worsened in the post-colonial period, unquote. In plain English, we have done more damage to our forests than our colonial masters did. Why did we do this to ourselves? First, just like the gold, the timber industry was seen as an easy source of foreign exchange. Earnings from timber rose to a record $200 million in the 1980s per annum. Today, they have steadily declined to around $50 million and it's going down as the timber got exhausted. And replanting efforts were half-hearted and lacked seriousness. Even more unfortunate is the fact that due to the non-processing of our timber, the sums earned from timber exports were the barest minimum possible. Similarly, our minerals are exported in unprocessed form. But all attempts to encourage and indeed legislate adequate value addition to timber were vigorously resisted by timber loggers and millers as huge tropical trees that had taken hundreds of years to mature were shipped out for a fraction of what would have been earned if we had processed them into the much more valuable tertiary products like furniture. The leadership and membership 
of the loggers were all indigenous Ghanaians. They pillaged our timber resources as if they were on a mission to impoverish their own nation. They vigorously and publicly resisted efforts to ban the export of logs and insisted on exporting round logs in completely unprocessed form. The timber industry is now a pale shadow of what it was. Most furniture today on Spring Test Road, you can see, is currently imported because we did not set out to understand that industry when it was mainly wood-based and when we had a natural comparative advantage. The gallant efforts of companies like Equiaba, Ashanti Furniture, Kumasi Furniture and Joinery, Pea Wood Processing, did not make them into the furniture giants they could have become, due principally to the focus on exporting round locks at the expense of developing a real furniture industry. In fact, in their dying days, I remember P. Wood even tried to import timber into Ghana to make furniture. We should have listened to expert advice and banned the export of round locks. Instead, we allowed populist commentators to dictate policy. The timber merchants are mostly dead and gone now. They are Mercedes-Benz vehicles. They sold our timber logs to purchase are long broken down. Meanwhile, we face massive reforestation bills. This example of our timber industry is an indication of where our illegal mining recklessness could lead our nation to. And I remember the then government's uh, fight against illegal logging. To the extent that sales and distribution, if you recollect, those of you old enough, that chainsaws were monitored and controlled, sometimes even banned. But people found their ways around government policy by smuggling in chainsaws through our land borders. We were like a people determined, despite the best efforts of our government, to destroy our timber resources for a pittance. The current fight against Galamsi reminds me eerily of that fight and how even the so-called revolutionary government of that day lost the fight. As a result, choice timber species like Aphromosia, Odum, Asamfuna, and the famous Mahogany were exploited into extinction. Why did this happen? Was it because the government as the leader refused to lead and allowed uninformed but loud-mouthed citizens to call the shots and defy lawful authority? The arguments for logging included the protection of jobs and livelihoods. My question is, is it every job that is worth protecting? A cynical friend describes this as an example of the fact that no power of government, especially in a liberal democracy, can withstand the resolve of a people determined to destroy themselves and their heritage in the name of protecting their right to earn a living. But cynicism aside, we must find an acceptable way of allowing our people to earn a living, and I'll come to that soon. Let me add that just like today, leaders in society, traditional, economic, cultural, political, who should have, and sometimes did know better, succumbed to the temptation of easy money and joined in the rape of our timber resources. The lessons from yesteryear must be learned and not allowed to happen again. How this can be done remains the big question. How do we stop Galamse? How do we ensure that private wealth is not realized at the expense of public good? Galamse is hard and dangerous work. The reports about lost lives are regular. What desperation drives young people to such risky work? It's supposed to be lucrative. The question I ask is lucrative for who? In one study, only 13% of miners, the people we see covered with mud and dying in their pits, only 13% of them in that study claimed an increase in income over non galamsey work. At the same time, 
Huge tax revenue is lost from Galamse. A study by Crawford and Boche published estimated that $2.3 billion was lost in tax revenue between 2010 and 2017. That's an average of $300 million per year. So who are the people benefiting from illegal gold mining? Obviously, not the actual miners who are paid a daily wage. A nation with security forces should be able to find and identify the actual beneficiaries and not concentrate efforts on the miners alone. Isn't it our failure as a nation to provide employment opportunities for these young people? That is the primary cause of Galamse. And that is the reason why, in preparing for this lecture, I looked at the initiative community mining meant to replace Galamse. I think it stands a good chance of success. But it must be implemented quickly, fairly, extensively. Purchase of products from community mining schemes should be at prices that compare favorably with what gold smugglers pay, who mainly buy them from Galamse operators. There should be the cash to do that. But if we identify a solution and we don't go ahead to implement the solution in an expeditious and prompt manner, then it's no solution at all. So the community mining scheme must be supported massively to succeed. Otherwise, the huge afforestation bills we face as a nation could be replicated in a few short years by the environmental cleanup bills from Galamse and illegal mining. We have recognized the problem and thankfully identified a solution. If we do not take the action required now, whose fault would it be? My next story, ladies and gentlemen, started from the immediate post-independence period. One testament to the quality of the economic advice available to our first post-independence government was that it recognized the need for rapid industrialization by way of manufacturing as the viable path to national development and job creation, underlying job creation for the young nation. The buzzwords in those days were economic takeoff, you know, from Rostow's stages of economic development, with import substitution as the manufacturing strategy to ensure the desired economic takeoff. In later years, it became economic liberalization and then structural adjustment. This became the buzzwords. In recent times, buzzwords are coming up again. And the new term is economic transformation, which has replaced structural adjustment. In all this, the constant is import substitution. This is the constant refrain in policy dialogues in our nation. An import substitution, just for the benefit of some of the young people here, is the establishment of factories which would manufacture the many items of everyday use that the developing nation like ours imports regularly. The post-independent strategy of import substitution led to the establishment of factories ranging from fruit processing and some canneries, wenchi tomato, polugu tomato, you recollect, through electronic assembly uh, Tema Kasanoma, glass bottle manufacturing, a bottle glass, Bogatanga meat factory for making our beloved corned beef, Kumasi shoe factory for making shoes, etc., etc. You all know this. Today, fans of our revered first president, Dr. Sajefo, recall these factories with great nostalgia and ask for a return of those import substitution industries. What I do not hear is any analysis on why these factories failed. The default explanation normally is that these factories collapsed with Osajefo, and so whoever saw of Osajefo must also have been responsible for their collapse. As happens often in discussions on economic development, our economists have left the public discourse to political activists who see most things through convenient ideological lenses program to give answers that serve political ends rather than lessons in economic management. The evidence shows 
that the overthrow of Kwame Nkrumah had little to do with the failure and collapse of these factories. The reality is that most of these factories were already on wobbly legs by 24th February 1966 as foreign exchange shortages and the resultant import license regime made their operations difficult to sustain. Import licenses, if you look at our history, were first introduced in Ghana as early as 1961. The objective was to allocate insufficient foreign exchange to deserving importers at low fixed rates in order to keep prices down. Good intentions, but as far as economic policy making goes, that was most unfortunate policy making. I dare say that because the Nkrumah government had by this time rid itself of some of the world class economists, such as Sir Arthur Lewis, the first black to win the Nobel Prize in economics, whom Kwame Nkrumah had brought in in the early 50s to help him with economic policy formulation. A common feature of these import substitution factories was that they required large and regular amounts of foreign exchange to survive. But they were not export oriented and couldn't earn any foreign exchange. They were set up to replace imports and not to seek export markets. Most did not even have an export marketing office. They relied on the foreign exchange brought in by the cocoa farmers, the gold exports, the diamonds, to keep them running. In the early 60s, what happened? The wartime boom in commodity prices ended. Cocoa prices collapsed, along with other commodity prices, like palm oil, granules, and all that, leading to a shortage of foreign exchange in our country. The currency should have been allowed to depreciate, as we have subsequently become used to, whenever there is a foreign exchange shortage. Instead, a fixed exchange rate was maintained. Import licenses were therefore introduced to enable qualified importers obtain foreign exchange at the official rate. Very good intentions. But this led to the development of the first ever foreign currency black market in Ghana. Anybody who could obtain foreign currency at the official rate could sell it on the black market and make a good margin. Officials responsible for issuing import licenses and allocating the scarce foreign exchange became very important people. Bribes and tips to obtain import licenses became the order of the day. State-owned factories, the import substituting factories, could not pay bribes and so couldn't obtain the imports required to survive. Briefcase wielding people with contacts became import license agents and middlemen. They obtained foreign exchange at the low official rate and resold it at the high black market rate. This was the first instance of the economic rent seeking behavior which has become pervasive in different forms in our country. Shortage of foreign exchange was the immediate reason for the collapse of in these industries. But there was another and for me even more critical reason. I say this because Eventually, some of these factories got divested or sold to private F, uh, people. And after the exchange rate adjustments, they could get foreign exchange at the new exchange rate. You know, they still did not become profitable and sustainable. In other words, with foreign exchange available at market price, which was the corrected exchange rate, the factories could not compete with imported goods and thus could not substitute them. The solution we took as a country was to impose higher and higher import duties to protect these companies. But in a country surrounded by three French-speaking countries that had no such import substitution agenda and who relied on imports from Europe and France in particular, the high import duties merely encouraged smuggling from the surrounding countries. The creation of a border guard, which was the next step. When we couldn't stop it from coming, we created a whole military unit called border guard. That also did not help the situation. In effect, high import duties, armed border guards, could not help the import substituting industry survive. 
from Bonsa Thai to Kumasi Jude Factory to Pualugu Tomato to Kumasi Leather and Tanning, none of these industries and none of the earlier ones mentioned has been successfully revived to this day. And it is not for lack of trying. Many attempts, including some by the Ghana Armed Forces, have been made to revise these companies. They tried to revive a Kumasi Shoe Factory. The whole Ghana Army, they couldn't. So beyond the availability of foreign exchange, what were the other factors militating against them? The most important factor, in my opinion, for the difficulties faced by these factories, even under Kwame Nkrumah, and their collapse soon after him, was the absence of what I call adequate value chains on which these factories and the whole import substitution industrialization agenda should have been anchored. In other developing countries, particularly in Asia, import substitution served as the beginning of an industrialization agenda, which rapidly moved to vertical integration into raw material production and other inputs based on an identified value chain. Long-term success in manufacturing must be based on deeper value chains than the marginal value-adding import substitution strategy. As the value chains of the so soon to be called Asian tigers deepened, they could afford to give discounts which no Ghanaian manufacturer could match. Remember the car battery factory in the Cropon? Soon lost the market to batteries from China. The electronic assembly plant in Tema, Akasadoma, lost to Sanyo. Now let's spend a minute, ladies and gentlemen, on vertical integration and value chains with an illustration from Indonesia, and then we'll look at some from Ghana. I chose Indonesia because, like Ghana, it has some of the richest mineral resources in the world, and it was exporting raw materials on a huge scale, just like Ghana. In recent times, Indonesia has placed bans on the export of some industrial raw materials, such as nickel, in order to realize their value chains locally. Nickel is a raw material for the production of stainless steel in combination with iron ore. And Indonesia has both, nickel and iron ore. Following the ban, and with appropriate, uh, what I'll call seed money to undertake the necessary studies to require to attract investors, stainless steel production shot up from 24,000 metric tons in 2016 to 5 million metric tons in 2022. Six years. The contribution of nickel and iron ore to GDP is estimated at $43 billion, with a B. And it employs 357,000 people. This is the kind of value chain exploitation that we need to study and copy. And a few examples of such deep value chains in Ghana, iron and steel, of course, bauxite and aluminum, of course, pulp and paper, you know, now that we have oil and petrochemicals, manganese, and now we have lithium, manganese, lithium into batteries, you know. But to be fair to ourselves, there have been times in our history when some of these value chains have been recognized and attempts made to develop them. Unfortunately, these attempts have been inconsistent. I'll give you one example. One administration in Ghana started a pulp plantation in the western region, in a place called Dabuase, to be precise, to be used to produce paper. However, it was ignored by succeeding administrations. They put together about, if I remember, 10 or 20,000 acres of pulp plantation. This was ignored by succeeding administrations and ended up being used for firewood because the trees had overgrown the pulping stage, the state at which you can use it for pulp. At the same time, we continue to import finished paper and cut it into typing sheets and tissue rolls as an import substituting industry. There is no way we can be competitive enough to export paper products 
if we do not start from the plantations. And the local price of paper products will go up every time there is a foreign exchange shortage and the currency depreciates. Import substitution is not a long-term viable proposal on its own. Entire value chains are required to make the import substituted products competitive for exporting so as to generate the foreign exchange required to keep the industries running. Let me use bauxite and aluminium to illustrate how the linkages from such a single complete value chain can dramatically serve as a catalyst to galvanize industrialization in a huge manner. And, and just for your information, Indonesia has recently banned the export of bauxite also. After what they saw with iron ore and nickel, they are now banning the bo uh, bauxite. In addition to the primary aluminum which is produced from bauxite and which is required for the manufacture of literally hundreds of products, extrusions, aircraft parts, motor vehicle parts, roofing sheets, etc., etc., the value chain includes critical products like aluminum sulfate, which we use for water treatment, which we still import in, into Ghana, uh, salt chlorine, caustic soda. I mean, the, the value chain in bauxite aluminum is huge. A comprehensive and um, when I read this study, uh, I didn't know. But a comprehensive study of that value chain, bauxite aluminum, in the first years of upstream oil mining in Ghana in 2010 by a consultancy called Enos Consult. And it's available with uh, NDPC. And in my office, I got a copy. Demonstrated that using the additional financial resources available from the then newly discovered oil and gas, Ghana could have over the next 10 years, between 2010 and 2020, we could have driven our per capita income to $10,000 per head and created 3 million jobs if we had used that newly discovered money from oil to exploit that value chain. Plainly put, we could have leveraged over $1 billion of new resources that came that first couple of years to fully integrate the bauxite aluminum value chain. Instead, we made different choices about the use of the new cash inflows from our oil and gas. A number of powerfully connected companies suddenly came up with several hundred million dollar projects, including one wanted to assemble and supply laptops to everybody, every school, every, every in Ghana. And with various youth in Agri, youth in this, youth in this, all various such projects, you know, and they all got paid from this new oil money. It will make an interesting study to document the use of Ghana's first oil money in the first five years of oil. It is one of the greatest lost opportunities of our nation. Madam Chair, ladies and gentlemen, the good news is that an initiative similar to that is being attempted in Ghana. About four years ago, a Ghana Integrated Aluminium Development Corporation was set up to help realize this important value chain. But no money. The oil money is gone. So the mandate says that it should attract private sector investment. In the circumstances, considerable progress is being made, you know. But the point is that other opportunities in Ghana value chains need to be packaged and brought to the attention of credible international investors that we don't have the money ourselves does not mean we cannot find the money. Let me caution, however, that such value chains invariably require substantial upgrades in infrastructure, such as railways, power, you know. Organizations mandated to provide infrastructure can more easily realize their mandates if they are allowed to operate with minimum interference. Vested interest in economic rent seekers should not be allowed anywhere near the process. Too many of our very well-educated and knowledgeable people seek to make immediate fortunes as commission agents and project promoters, even though they only offer contacts and introductions to high places. They call themselves businessmen and hover around decision-makers, seeking to influence decisions 
in favor of whoever will pay them. They are the economic rent seekers of our time, just like the import license purveyors of the early 1960s. To illustrate, let me give you an example. The Western Rail Line from Sekendi Takrade to Kumase should be a financially visible line, given the volumes of bauxite, manganese, cocoa available to be freighted. Why has this la line been so difficult to build and complete? And just by way of reminder, during colonial times, when that line was originally built, the extension of that line from Takwa to Oboase was made possible because of revenue guarantees in the form of promissory notes be given by the then Ashanti Goldfields of 30,000 pounds per annum. Today, that will be about 6 million pounds per annum. That, those promissory notes made it possible for the colonial government to raise money to extend the railway line from Takwa to Kumasi. And you should read uh, Iowa Taylor's uh, uh, PhD thesis from uh, London School of Economics, where she goes into the history and the board minutes of Ashanti Goldfields and the processes by which they arrived at these decisions. These are history which we learn to learn. We need to find and learn, you know. Uh, uh, and thanks to Iowa and Free Fat Taylor. In our times, even today, if you look at the money spent on cocoa roads from 2008, when that policy was started, to, to 2020, we have spent over a billion dollars on cocoa roads. We could have used that billion dollars to deliver that railway line. It's a matter of priorities and choices. Cocoa roads cost $100 million in 2008, $200 million in 2011, and $150 million annually from 2015 to 2020. That's over a billion. It is well known that Akosombo Dam was largely financed on the back of undertaking from Kaiser Aluminium to buy the bulk of the power to be generated in their Valco smelter. Indeed, Kwame Nkrumah had to agree to the ridiculously low price Kaiser Aluminium insisted on against the advice of his own negotiating team because that was the only way to have the dam built. With the benefit of hindsight, the wisdom in that decision is obvious. And we thank Kwame for that. Why are we finding it difficult to deliver such game-changing projects in our time? Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, my proposal is that these national projects should not have commission agents and representatives of foreign companies and project brokers walking the corridors of power seeking their fortunes. Such projects should be open to international competitive bidding and have the best national teams made up of seasoned public servants aided by salaried consultants negotiating the best terms for the nation. The Ghana Public Service, in my experience, has some of the best educated people in our country, definitely better educated than we have in the private sector and more experienced than we have in the private sector. Together with project-specific salaried consultants, local and foreign, Ghana should be able to structure and execute these transactions in a timely and cost-effective manner. Madam Chair, I have mentioned the matter of economic rent seekers and the pernicious effect of power brokers on our policy making, procurement and implementation. Permit me to illustrate with another story. This time documented by Kofi Akenya in his recently launched memoir. And Kofi tells the story of sometime in 1963, when a Ghanaian businessman arranged for a Mercedes-Benz vehicle to be presented as a gift to Kwame Nkrumah at his official residence. The president was not amused and ordered an investigation into the source of wealth of his benefactor. The investigation revealed that the donor, one HB, let's just use the initials, HB had made money in concert with the then Minister of Agri, a gentleman called FYA, and one JQ, also a businessman. Apparently, the businessman had sold German-made machines meant for spraying cocoa farms 
to protect against black poor disease and made so much money that they had decided to give the president an unforgettable gift. Nothing wrong with it, right? The problem was that the German vendor had originally approached the minister with an offer to sell the machines at a considerably lower price. The minister arranged with the businessmen to set up a company which became an agent and sold the machines at a much higher price to government. They were prosecuted and convicted on 10th May 1965 of stealing 512 pounds. The rest of the story is that in October 1968, the conviction was overturned on a technicality. But you see the point. Meant for government at a certain price. They, they, they clap together and we know the result. This was one of the earliest cases of procurement fraud in our nation. Our nation has from earlier from our earliest days, grappled with the problem of inflated pricing for government purchases. A look at what MTN Foundation pays for classroom blocks against what government of Ghana pays is revealing, I'm told. Indeed, the inadequate value for money in government procurement is a recurrent theme in national discourse. It's amazing that the people so used to bargaining in our everyday lives cannot use this skill in the service of our nation. All measures from the centralized purchasing days of Ghana Supply Commission through the Ghana National Procurement Agency, which was used to purchase essential commodities, to the current public procurement authority seem to have failed to protect the public from ravaging private businessmen and they are public businessmen accomplices. Who should we blame for this sad state of public procurement? It is time, I believe, for academia to step in. It is time for our behavioral scientists and our sociologists to join forces with procurement professionals and our lawmakers in re reviewing the public procurement law and fashioning a new one that will better serve our purposes. I think that game theory and optimization techniques can help design a more efficient public procurement system and a law to back it. I remember the days when market women in particular and traders generally were accused of being selfish and greedy and the word kalabule was coined to describe their conduct after public weapons failed to change their behavior, a quiet economic liberalization and a floating exchange rate were what it took to end Kalabuli and restore sanity in our markets. A similar solution may be waiting to bring sanity to public procurement. Madam Chair, a few words about one important lesson that the development of China, I think, should teach us in Ghana, maybe in all of Africa. The rapid development of China commenced in 1978, when the country adopted a dual system of liberal market economics and a communist political system. Between 1978 and 2007, the economy grew at an amazing 10% average annually, and per capita income in China increased 10 times. From a nominal GDP of 200 billion in 1980, China's GDP grew to 7 trillion in 2011. By the way, Ghana's GDP, we are currently at about what, 70 or 80, 77 billion. The question we should ask, and which, I, which made me curious, is how come a country from, how can a country come from a communist centrally planned economy and rapidly change to a liberal market economy so successfully and i found that a big part of that answer lies in a massive amount of policy assistance that china received embraced and used from the Bretton woods institutions particularly the world bank and the imf 
These institutions are the unheralded, but the key architects of the remarkable successful economic story of modern China. It is well known that, and I'm quoting Michael Pillsbury, that by 1990, the largest World Bank staff mission was in Beijing. That is the largest anywhere in the world, was in Beijing. Without revealing the bank's behind the scenes role, China's leadership followed almost all the international organization's advice. Indeed, one economist, and many of you here will know him, well known in Ghana, became the bank's principal economist and was instrumental in designing strategy and policy for China. A gentleman was called Peter Harold, and he was a World Bank country director for Ghana. And amongst his many battles in Ghana was getting Ghanaians to accept the HIPIC initiative. Our national pride was too fragile to accept it. Accepting debt forgiveness was considered demeaning. I wonder how many people still think that way today. From Ghana, Peter Harold moved to China, where he used the same analytical tools and expertise to make a huge difference. I strongly re recommend a paper he edited with two others titled Macroeconomic Management in China. And it is uh, a collection of the papers presented at an economic conference in Dailin, China in 1993. The hard fact is that these institutions actually do more analytical work on our economy than we do ourselves. The least we can do is to seriously consider the policy options they suggest. It is fashionable in Ghana to condemn these institutions and claim no country has developed under their watch. This is patently false. Across Asia, these institutions have given advice and helped nations grow their economies remarkably well. These institutions produce the Asian tigers. In Africa, we want to be lions, but ignore the medicine the Asian tigers took assiduously. From the free zones concept as part of export promotion policy to gratis technology centers as a foundation for our industrial development and regular tax policy advice, the World Bank and IMF have given good and useful policy advice to our nation. Except that the same free zone concepts they took to China, when they gave it to Ghana, we didn't implement it as well as we should have. The same gratis and the technology centers they took there, we didn't do it, we didn't go the full hog because we listened to non specialists on radio and people who have no business giving policy advice. The International Finance Corporation, indeed, and I believe they still have an office in Accra, set up an office in Accra and was struggling to find adequate bankable manufacturing projects to support, to put money into. They ended up putting it into MTN, telecoms, and things like that. Why the problem with finding local manufacturing opportunities? The lack of a realistic manufacturing promotion policy, absence of value chains, and easier ways of making money continues to be our bane. As a nation, many of our best and brightest find it easier to spend their energies on obtaining lucrative public contracts for imported goods and services, rather than the hard work involved in setting up and growing manufacturing industry. Of course, I don't blame people or fault them for choosing the easier option. The reward system is skewed because over the years, national policies at the micro and sector level does not support production. Instead, every policy from insisting on exchange rate stability to benefit uh, people importing second-hand spare parts in the face of local inflation, to the many legislated exemptions from import duty undermines local production efforts. Even local content rules are allowed exemptions under the law. And in short order, the exemptions become the norm. Our inability and sometimes plain unwillingness to enforce local laws give traders and importers a clear advantage over local production. It is no wonder that we have become a nation of traders. Unfortunately, in the process, we lose the quality and career-building manufacturing jobs 
on which middle-class families can be nurtured and grown. We are rapidly becoming a society of a small, affluent minority benefiting from economic rent, public procurement, trading monopolies, and a vast unemployed and underemployed majority stuck in low-skilled, dead-end trading and service industry jobs. Waiters and waitresses. And in the process, the policies of appeasement of this big majority with low prices and free social programs because of their voting power becomes the route to seeking power and retaining political power. The process goes full cycle. When economic rent beneficiaries justify their unearned fortunes by claiming to finance politics, some even brazenly step into the political fray with their unearned fortunes and seek power for themselves. We forget that the solution to general poverty is not low prices and free goods. The solution to poverty is income generation from skilled and sustainable jobs. Manufacturing and production are the means to such jobs. Fortunately, fortunately, we have not reached a tipping point, and there is still time and opportunity to take responsibility for ourselves. The first step is to identify the appropriate value chains, as I have said. We must make manufacturing policy based on these chains and make our limited resources available to manufacturing within the chains. Market access for local pr production should be a priority. Every locally produced effort should be given priority over imports with a price advantage, especially in the early stages. Periodic review and sunset clauses will prevent abuse of such price advantage. Development and enforcement of national quality standards must be rigorous. At the same time, regulatory agencies must have a facilitatory approach rather than policing. These measures will quickly scale up competitive local manufacturing within and across established value chains. A few last words to end this conversation. Seeing that we are in the academic environment of Ghana's premier university, it is my hope that this conversation will prompt somebody to insist that the economic history of our nation should find a place in our curriculum. I do not just mean the economic, the macro history of the ups and downs of our national income and interest rates and inflation, etc. In addition to this, the history of the development of different sectors, such as agriculture, health, mining, industry, construction, should be the subject of study and case studies to inform policymakers. Closely aligned with this suggestion is the need for more interaction between academia and policymakers. This will help researchers zone in on areas of concern to policymakers and provide factual analysis to aid policy. Too much policy in our nation is based on perceptions and brainwaves without rigorous background study. As a result, many policies which have been tried before without expected success gets recycled because policymakers do not know about the previous efforts. Any student of our economy will tell you our problems are cyclical. Look back and you will find that every government in our nation has had an economic crisis. Once in a while, a new gold discovery, or turning over more forests to timber, or oil discovery, or an upturn in world commodity prices, especially for cocoa, will seem to have resolved our problems. But the next crisis is always on the way, as we expand our consumption appetites to accommodate the new resources. Today, we seem to be banking our hopes on new green minerals like lithium. That is all well and good. However, let us study the lithium value chain and maximize our advantages, not just from the current high lithium prices of today, but from the complete lithium to bat battery value chain. Indeed, already studies show that in the next decade, 10 years from now, the prices of lithium will be about a tenth of what they are today because lithium is being found all over the world. And what we have found, if we are not fast with it, we will end up 
with what we call uh, abandoned resources. If we fail to do that, we would have lost another opportunity. And whose fault would it be? Men, at some times, are masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves that we are underlings. Happily, happily, Brutus also reminds us, this was Cassius, but Brutus reminds us that there is a tide in the affairs of men, which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life is bound in shallows and in miseries. This is the time to take the tide. I thank you most sincerely for your attention.